everyone, and welcome to this new session of Growing Our Friendship with Jesus. And I was tasked to, I was tasked by my boss to begin. <laughs> <laughs> and I gladly obeyed to, to give the, the initial talk. Um, it's nice seeing you on Zoom. I've met some of you. Uh, some of you I'm seeing for the first time. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you have seen me uh, the live stream mass, or perhaps um, you've attended one of our pilgrim masses. So again, welcome to all of you this evening. The uh, topic for this evening is... Um, you would have gotten an email from Melissa if you registered, and it would have the link to the Zoom. Do you want me to send it to you? Uh -huh. All right, it's praying with the sacred uh, the scriptures for, for Sunday, okay? So let's, let's begin with, with a prayer. And what I'd like to do is to um, read from the sacred scripture, the gospel of yesterday and the gospel of, of today. And I'll just connect both of them. And then we pause for a few, uh, maybe a minute or so to reflect. And then we'll end with a prayer and then we'll go with the talk. Thank you. So let's place ourselves in the presence of our loving God, acknowledging that he is indeed present as we listen to this gospel story. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Mm -hmm. I unmuted it, but now... He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone in debt to us, and do not subject us to the final test. And Jesus said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend to whom he goes at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has arrived at my house from a journey, and I have nothing to offer him. And he says in reply from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children and I are already in bed. I cannot get up to give you anything. I tell you, if he does not get up to give him the loaves, because of their friendship, he will get up to give him whatever he needs because of his persistence. And I tell you, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be open. What father among you would hand his son a snake when he asks for a fish, or hand him a scorpion when he asks for an egg? If you then who are wicked know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let us pray. May the Holy Spirit who proceeds from you, we pray, O Lord, enlighten our minds and lead us into all truth, just as your Son has promised. 
O God, to whom every heart lies open, every desire speaks plainly, and from whom no secret is hidden, cleanse, we pray, the thoughts of our heart by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that we may merit to love you perfectly and offer you worthy praise. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mary, do you have any announcements before we proceed? Myself, yeah. Let me unmute myself. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Father will uh, share his reflections. We're going to ask you for five minutes of silence. And then we're going to break you into breakout rooms, three of them. We have a couple reflection, faith sharing, prayer experiences with you. We'll share with that for about 15 minutes and we'll come back. And then Father is going to do an imaginative gospel for this coming Sunday. And we will end with that. Tomorrow morning, you will get an email with the reflection questions that we just did this evening and some journaling reflection questions for the imaginative gospel that Father will share. Just so you have an idea, right now, I cannot use my chat for some reason. I, I don't have it, but we'll get you an email with what you need, okay? I was going to send all those on a chat, but for some reason, it's not coming up for me today. So, so that's sort of how the evening is going, okay? Right. If anybody needs anything, just text me and I'll answer <laughs> that. Okay. All right. Thank you, Father. All right. Good evening once again. When Mary asked me to do a presentation this evening, I asked her what the topic is for the new season of growing our friendship with Jesus. And she mentioned that this new season is entitled or is focused on praying with the Sunday's scriptures, which is very, very important. But before we launch into that specific topic on praying with the Sunday's sacred scripture, I'd like to share with you my thoughts about prayer, my thoughts and reflections about prayer. Most of what I'm going to share with you this evening is taken from this book by Ronald Rollheiser, and the title of the book, it's a very short book. I'm sure some of you might have read this book. The title of it is Prayer, Our Deepest Longing. Prayer, Our Deepest Longing. And you will quickly find out that Ron Rolheiser is drawing from the spirituality of St. Augustine. The spirituality of St. Augustine. And I'll, I'll explain that uh, later as we progress, progress into the, the talk this evening. A few days ago, while I was out buying something, I came across a kitchen towel a hand towel, and I couldn't help but to, to get it. And the kitchen towel says, pray more, worry less. Pray more, worry less. I thought to myself, I said to myself, what a, an appropriate thing to to say, as I remind myself to pray more so that I don't worry that much. You and I have many worries, 
especially during this time of pandemic. Parents worry about their children. Parents worry about their children who are off to college. Parents are worried, especially here in the county of Santa Clara, as we begin to reopen in-person instructions. Some are worried about their employment. Some are also worried about what if I catch the virus? A friend of mine who is a frontliner phoned me a month or so ago and have been assigned on the unit where they take care of COVID patients. And when she called me, she was in tears and said, what if, what if I get infected with the virus? What will happen to my family? So a lot of worries during this time. There's also worry about the wildfires. There's also a worry, if I may just say it this evening, a worry about the upcoming elections, worry about our world. So many, so many preoccupations during this time. And we allow ourselves, we allow ourselves to be sucked into those worries. We allow ourselves to be sucked into those worries. And because we allow ourselves to be sucked into those worries, most days, most days, we don't pray simply because we don't quite get around to it. Why? Because of the many, many preoccupations that we have in life. In this book, written by Ronald Rollheiser, he talks about those preoccupations that we have. He talks about why we simply don't get into prayer during the day. And interestingly enough, Father Rolheiser uses the image of a car wash. He uses the image of a car wash. And I'd like to read that to you. Father Rolheiser says, when you pull up to a car wash, you are instructed to leave your engine running or the motor running. When you pull up and then take your hands off the steering wheel and to keep your foot off the brake. The idea, Father says, the idea is that the machine itself will suck you through. Then he goes on to say, for most of us, that's just what our typical day does to us. It sucks us through. We have smartphones and radio, radios that stimulate us before we are fully awake, he says. Many of us, myself included, are texting friends, checking Facebook and emails, watching the news, or listening to music or talk, or talk on radio. Before, he says, before we even shower or eat breakfast. Before we even shower, eat breakfast, we are already busy. We are already so preoccupied with so many things. Then he says, the drive to work follows. Of course, he wrote this pre-COVID. Then the drive to work follows. There's that same pattern, he says, is stimulated and preoccupied. We listen to the radio, talk on our cell phones, and plan the day's agenda. 
Then before you know it, we return home. And what do we do when we return home? He says, we return home to televisions, conversations, activities, and preoccupations of all kinds. Eventually, he says, we go to bed, where perhaps we read or watch a bit more TV. Finally, we fall asleep. Finally, we fall asleep. When, the question is, when in all of this did we take time to think, to pray, to wonder, to be restful, to be grateful for life, for love, for health, for God? Our normal day pre-COVID just sucked us through just sucked us through. The reality is, my friends, there is something innate in us. We want to pray. We want to be with our God. And that's part of who we are as God's children. We want to be, we want to pray. But there's also a part of us that says that we don't want to miss out on anything. We don't want to miss out on watching TV, socializing with our friends. Even during this time of COVID, we socialize with our friends. We even have Zoom having a drink with someone at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Or we have dinner with someone through Zoom. Because we don't want to miss out. We don't want to miss out on anything. We don't want to miss out on any experience. That is why the great writer Henry Nouwen, the great writer Henry Nouwen says, when it comes to prayer, it takes a lot of discipline. Prayer takes a lot of discipline. And we all know that the word discipline comes from a Latin word, which means a disciple, a student. When Henry Nouwen says that it takes a lot of discipline, prayer, in prayer, we need to be trained. We need to be trained. We need to educate ourselves on the importance and the need to be with our God, to be in conversation with our loving God. Now, we need to look deeper into what Father Rolheiser is talking about when it comes to prayer. As I've said earlier, Rolheiser's book, Prayer, Our Deepest Longing, in his book, he draws a lot from the spirituality of St. Augustine. St. Augustine, an early church father, and he grew up in a very rich family, a nobleman. His father, Patrick, his mother, St. Monica, they were rich. St. Augustine had everything. Bright man. He had a lot of women on the side, if I may say. He was gifted with a child, and he named the child Adiodatus, a gift from God. The meaning of Adiodatus. And Monica, the mother of St. Augustine, saw how Augustine lived his life. And Monica prayed for over 30 years for, for Augustine to be converted. Augustine knew at some point in his life, after his conversion, after his baptism, that 
Yes, he had everything, everything, basically everything. And yet, there was a deeper longing. There was such an emptiness in the heart of Augustine. He was longing for something. The knowledge, the women he had, the, the, the riches he had, all the food he had, that wasn't enough. There was a sense of emptiness in the life, in the life of St. Augustine. His heart was so empty that no one and nothing was able to fill that emptiness. Until he realized that his greatest longing is for God. His greatest longing is God. That is why he's known for his famous words. My heart is restless until it rests in you, my God. My heart is restless until it rests in you, my God. Augustine also says in his confessions, in his book, he says, late have I loved you, referring to God. Late have I loved you, O beauty ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved you. Then Augustine says, you are within me. You are within me. God, you are within me. But I was outside. You are within me. But I was outside. And it was there in the outside that I searched for you. I failed to see you in my heart. You're inside. But I was outside. I was searching for you all over the place. In my unloveliness, I plunged into the lovely things. The knowledge, the richness. Everything, he says, which you created. You were with me, Augustine says, but I was not with you. Augustine was searching and searching from the wrong place. He was not looking inward. He was looking out there, but he wasn't looking in the right place. He was trying his best to fill his emptiness with other stuff that only God, only God can fill. As I look back on the life of, of St. Augustine and what Rolf Heiser wrote in the book, I can say that prayer Prayer, my friends, is about falling in love. Prayer is about falling in love. If not all of you, most of you, you have fallen in love. I have fallen in love before I entered the seminary. I have fallen in love. You have fallen in love. You have been attracted to someone. And when you are attracted to that someone, just think of your kids. When they're attracted to someone, what is it that we want? We want to be with that person a lot. It doesn't matter how often, how long. Nowadays, they do Facebook as long as they have that person. Because of their attraction, they want to spend more time with that person. You don't want to miss the opportunity to be with that person. Prayer, when it comes to prayer, it is about falling in love. Why? Because we are made for love. We are made for intimacy with each other and with our loving God. Again, St. Augustine says, you have made us for yourself, Lord, 
and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And because prayer is about falling in love, I believe that God is the greatest lover of all. And we are the beloved. God is trying his very best to court us, to be with us. Because God longs to be with us. God wants to be with us. Today, though, we do not see our restless longings as pushing us toward the infinite. Father Rolheiser says, we have trivialized and tamed our longing. Instead of longing for the transcendent, he says, we distract ourselves by focusing on our desires, on the good life, on money, success, and on whatever else we think everybody has. Father Rolheiser goes on to say, there, there is nothing inherently bad about being successful. There's nothing inherently bad about money. But, but if we define our longings as directed toward those things in themselves, we end up mostly disappointed and empty. Our disquiet persists and we remain restless and tired. And not only tired, but drained of energy rather than in a place of solitude where our very striving give us, give us energy. Again, we go back to that relationship of a lover and the beloved. When it comes to prayer, we want a perfect relationship with our God. We want a perfect relationship with our God. We want a perfect prayer. But if I were to ask you, the, the, the disadvantage of doing Zoom is I cannot ask you in person. When I ask you perhaps to define what perfection means or what perfect relationship means, you will say no problems, no challenges, it's flawless, no deficiencies. But you and I know that's unreal. That's unreal. Perfection in the Hebrew ideal is different from our definition of perfection. Perfection, perfection involves all the things that I mentioned, joy, pain, sorrow, challenges, problems. That is why perfection in prayer is this. Perfection in prayer is this. To walk with God despite our flaws. Perfection means being with God. Being in the presence of God. In spite of the fact that we are not perfectly whole, good, true, and beautiful. We need to stop beating ourselves and say, I'm imperfect, God doesn't love me. That's not true. No matter who we are, we are loved by God. God knows our mistakes. God knows that we are going to disappoint, disappoint him, but it doesn't matter. What God is simply asking of us is that we come home. What God is simply asking of us 
is to approach him just like the story of the prodigal son. When the father was waiting at the gate for his son to return home. That's what God is expecting, expecting of us. Prayer, prayer, my friends, is about first trusting yourself, trusting in God's providence, trusting that you are loved by God, and getting ready to open your heart in such a way that you will hear God clearly, clearly say to you, I, I love you. I love you. That's what God wants to tell all of us in our prayer. I love you. All right, I'll open it up to questions or maybe. So let me, let, instead of you do that, because that's probably not going to be, I'm going to ask everybody, we're going to give you five minutes of silence just to kind of take in what Father just shared with us. I'm going to drop you into breakout rooms for 15 minutes and Linda and Ron and myself, we will join you to share two of the questions that Father just made statements about, and which will be about 20 minutes, and Father will share imaginative prayer uh, on the gospel. Okay, so we're going to ask you for silence, and then we will be in your, in your rooms.
Welcome back, everyone. All right, let's uh, move on before my boss fires me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. So the second part of this evening's uh, presentation or talk is, is really on um, how do we prepare or how do we reflect on, on the Sunday's gospel? And there, there, there are many forms of doing that. I'll, I'll just give you the way I, I do it. So it's not always the right way, uh, but I will, I will tell you my experience, the steps that I do, especially in preparing for uh, the, Sunday, the Sunday homily, because that's how we prepare for the Sunday homily, is I reflect on the Sunday, the Sunday scriptures. As many of us know, there are many, many different forms of prayer, right? Uh, there's contemplative prayer, wherein there's more time to spend in silence and solitude and being quiet and all of that. There is the interse intercessory prayer, uh, wherein we tell God everything, the laundry list of our needs uh, and all that. There's a prayer of thanksgiving. And there's an example of that in the sacred scripture, the Magnificat, the Song of Mary, and the Benedictus, the, the, the Song of Zechariah, after the birth of John the Baptist. And also there is what we call the imaginative prayer, which is really more Ignatian in, in, uh, in tone, Ignatian approach, where we imagine ourselves as part of, 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 of the gospel story. We imagine ourselves as one of the characters. We imagine ourselves as part of, of that, um, that event. So for the sake of our gathering this evening, I'd like to look at imaginative prayer. I know that uh, some of the members of the committee, they are experts on, on this, if I may say. But I'll share again the experience, my own experience on on um, imaginative prayer and how I prepare uh, and I pray with, with the sacred scripture. All right. When I was in the seminary, you were told that in order for us to prepare for the Sunday homily, that Sunday evening, we should read the sacred scripture for the following Sunday. That's how we were taught. That you read the first reading, you read the psalm because the psalm is part of the scripture, right? And then you read the second reading and then the gospel, the gospel reading. We were also told, if all possible, not to read from the lectionary. Not to read from the lectionary. Not to, I shouldn't say not to read from this is the day because we give it out. But not to read from the lectionary, but rather use the Bible. Use the Bible. Why do we need to use the Bible? We need to use the Bible in, in looking at the, the, the readings so that we have a better understanding of what's happening. What we can do is we look at what happened before and what's go, what happened after. So you, you situate yourself basically um, and the readings. So I suggest, I strongly suggest that when we are reflecting on the Sunday scripture, that we use, we use the Bible so that we can always go back. Ah, this is what happened prior to Jesus saying this. Oh, this is what happened after Jesus has said this. Oh, this is what happened after this took place. All right. So I make sure that you read the sacred scripture. After you have read it for the first time, the second time you're going to sit down with the sacred scripture, don't read it. What do I mean? Pray with the sacred scripture. That's different. Don't just read it. Pray with the words of God. Basically, what we're doing is we're using the word of God in prayer. We're not using our own words. We're using God's words when we are praying to our God. Because the sacred scripture is the word, the word of God. Okay? And as I've said, if you are 
perhaps like me or the deacons or Father Edgar, as they say, when you are reading the sacred scripture, make sure you have the newspaper next to you. But nowadays, I don't really want to read the newspaper because they're, you know. But anyway, but they always say read the paper or maybe watch the uh, watch uh, news to make sure you are aware of what's happening around you. The other thing that you do, watch your breathing when you're praying with the sacred scripture. That's very important. Watch your breathing. Then listen for details as you pray with the sacred scripture. Who is in the sacred scripture? Who's there in the story? What are they doing in the story? How are they interacting in the story? What time of the day it is? That's important. What time of the day it is? Like the story of the Samaritan woman, for example, in John's gospel. Why did the Samaritan woman go to the well at noon? He could have gone early in the morning. Hello? I mean, why would you go at noon? That's important. So that no one would see her. That's why she went to the well at noon. Okay? What is the mood? The atmosphere. You have to look at that as well, okay? Then you, you continue to imagine yourself as one of the characters in the passage that you have just read. You will notice more detail and begin to feel yourself in that place. Begin your, to, to, to look at the different parts, the different scenarios, part of the scenery. You may be a person... You may be a thing, for example. You might be the gold or the frankincense or the myrrh that was offered to Jesus when, when Jesus was born. Okay? You, can be, you, can be, um, you can be Mary, perhaps. You can be Joseph, perhaps. Just imagine yourself as one of the main characters in the, the story that we are reading. Be familiar with the sound. Be familiar with the sound in the reading. Be familiar with the smell. Huh? There's a lot of talk about incense. A lot of talk about, about uh, oil. What's the smell of it? What's the aroma? Food, even. Jesus loved to party. I wonder how it tastes. What, what does it taste of? A nice roast leg of lamb or bitter herb or the wine. The water that turned into wine. How did it taste? Is it as good as the, the wine that we have at Napa? I don't know. I mean, you know, things like that. Uh, about the location that you notice. What are the emotions and the undertones that you notice? Then, when you pray with the sacred scripture, don't Fight it, meaning allow the Spirit to move you. Allow the Spirit to guide you. Okay, sometimes we, when we pray the sacred scripture, we fight it. We want to say, oh, this is what I want to pray for. Empty yourself of all of that. Empty yourself of all of that. Let the Word of God speak to you. Let the Word of God speak to you. And just take a moment of silence and allow yourselves, as, as you eat the Word of God, as you are nourished with the Word of God, allow the Word of God to be part of who you are. To be part of who you are. And you just do that. Do that on a Sunday. Pray with it the following day. All the way to Friday. Just listen. Because every single time you read the sacred scripture, you capture something that's new. No matter how often you have read it, no matter how many times you have read the story, you will always, always find something new in the sacred, sacred scripture. Then the important part, when you come to Mass on Sunday, you are ready to listen to God's word proclaimed to us. I always, always discourage, 
I always discourage people reading while the word is being proclaimed. Because really, we ought to listen to the word of God. We shouldn't be reading while the word of God is being proclaimed. We must be at, our ears must be attuned as to how the word is being proclaimed to all of us. Then as you listen to the word of God, we say, ah, I heard that. Ah, that's what it means. Ah, this is what is God telling me? So you are ready to come to celebrate the word of God and be nourished, nourished by God's word. Listen to how it's being proclaimed. Listen to the words carefully as how it is proclaimed, how it is proclaimed to, to each one of us. So this evening, what I'd like to do as we conclude this, we, as we conclude this evening, what I'd like to do is to try, I'm going to read the gospel reading for this Sunday. And in the silence of your heart, imagine yourself as God or Jesus talking to you. Imagine yourself as one of the characters. Imagine yourself as part, part of the gospel story. So let's do it. I could, if I could invite you to sit comfortably, watch your breathing, quiet your heart and your mind as we listen to the gospel story. Jesus again in reply spoke to themselves in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He dispatched his servants to summon the invited guests to the feast, but they refused to come. A second time, he sent other servants saying, tell those invited, Behold, I have prepared my banquet. My calves and fattened cattle are killed, and everything is ready. Come to the feast. Some ignored the invitation and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest laid hold of his servants mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged and sent his troops, destroy those murderers and burn their city. Then he said to his servants, the feast is ready. But those who were invited were not worthy to come. Go out therefore into the main roads and invite to the feast whomever you find. The servants went out into the streets and gathered all they found, bad and good alike. And the hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet the guest, he saw a man there not dressed in a wedding garment. He said to him, my friend, how is it that you came in here without a wedding garment? But he was reduced to silence. Then the king said to his attendants, bind his hands and feet and cast him into the darkness outside where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Many are invited, but few are chosen. You just take a few minutes to reflect on the reading.
Okay. If there's any one of you who'd like to share anything that you heard from the scripture today, or perhaps what did you feel listening and praying with that sake, that that passage? What's the experience like? For me, it was kind of harsh. I mean, it, it went back and forth to understanding it, and but then it being so harsh against the people. Um, I, I put myself in the position of being one of the guests that was invited, but didn't end up going because I was tired, busy, some reason and didn't go. And I think that happens a lot where, like with prayer and stuff that you're invited, but do you show up? There goes my homily for Sunday. Well, I think, you know, at the beginning, uh, Jesus invites, you know, certain people. And I just imagine, like, you know, the, the elite the chosen ones, the Jewish people. And it's like they didn't show up or they rejected him. And so it's like, okay, well, I'll get anybody, everybody. <clears throat> you know, people are invited um, to come to this feast. I mean, and I was thinking about this wonderful feast that people were going to be coming to. Um, and I guess, you know, all the food and the tastes and the smells that you, talk, that you mentioned as to what to look for. And I think, too, you know, not having the right clothes, I think that's kind of a symbol of... Um, not being open, having an open heart. Um, it's like, you know, yes, you want to go, but then you have all these reasons for not doing it because it takes you out of your comfort level. Father Richie, there were a couple of things that struck me. One, when people didn't come the first time, the king was sort of like saying, they're not worthy. And maybe they just chose not to go. So I was feeling this, I, maybe I'm not worthy to be invited. But then later, the, the notion that we're all called, right? And I don't know if it's a matter of being chosen or if it's a matter of me accepting God's invitation. It's, it's on me to do that, not on anybody else. So, you know, I just have to listen and follow and allow God, you know, to lead me in the right direction. So, yeah, it's hard for me to put myself in that, in that particular passage for whatever reason. It's just more the words I was hearing. So you see how the word of God is alive the word of god is alive and active in our lives that as i've said earlier no matter how many times we have heard the gospel story there's always something new we can always pick something pick up something from the sacred scripture that we have read as Jesus says, after he proclaimed, read from the scroll, the first time he went, when he began his public ministry, he says, today, this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. The word of God is fulfilled every single time we put it into action, not only just listening to it, not only just praying with it, but when we put it into action, when we live it out, the word of God becomes even more powerful and alive, and it is fulfilled in the hearing of others. 
So I invite all of us in the next few weeks, and perhaps not only the next few weeks, but every day, to try our very best to reflect on the daily readings. As they say, if you follow the, the readings of the daily readings and you follow it the three cycles, once you have finished those three cycles, some people would say that you have probably read the whole Bible. Almost, not, not all, but almost, if you follow the whole three cycles. So try our very best to pray with the sacred scripture. Because as I've said earlier, when we are praying with the sacred scripture, we're actually using God's word to pray to God. We're just bringing to God his own word and listening to God by praying the sacred scripture. I could not stress it more how important it is to, to reflect on um, the word of God in our daily lives. That's all I have for the evening. Before I close it with a prayer, I'll turn it in to Mary. Right. So before we get Father's blessing, we'll just, let me give you a little. So next, uh, tomorrow morning, you'll get an email with the reflection questions you spoke about, but also two or three of the questions to do some journaling in preparation for Sunday's mass for liturgy. Um, and then we'll send a reminder for next week hope to see you all and then it, does anybody have any questions for mary or for me yeah for any me. questions that you might have yes uh, are you going to be the speaker each time richie no <laughs> i'm not going to be the speaker every time okay okay i do have a question Yes, who, Joan? I'm oh, sorry, I'm not in camera. I'm not in there. <laughs> Carolina. Yes. My appearance. I, I came in late. I apologize, but I didn't want to interrupt. I, I do have a question as far as uh, the readings that Father Richie was mentioning. Uh, guidance for someone who is coming back to practicing and kind of lost the, the, the essence. So... Any guidance as far as submersing into, into the rituals? You, what, you mean guidance into reading the sacred scripture yes. or guidance yes. into... Yes, like wh where do I start? <laughs> where, where do you start? I think the best way to start is just looking at the readings of the day. Okay. Um, you know, picking up one of those, this is the day that that's available for all of us. Okay. Uh, it has the readings for the whole month it has a morning prayer evening prayer it has a reflection um so you might want to start with that then if you have questions i'm available to help you out you can do it either through email zoom um, father edgar is also available to help you and guide you any of the staff members of holy spirit is available to help you just let us know does that this help, is, Catalina? This, this is Linda. Yes, I, was just going, I was just going to add, Catalina, that a good place to start is simply coming back here with us each week and having a new prayer experience each time, each, each Thursday. We would love to have you join us. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anyone else? Joan. Um, I was wondering when, when you were saying to read it from the actual Bible, Father, Yeah. did you mean just the gospel or look up everyone? Because I have the book. You can use this yeah. is the day. That's, um, I should not have said though. I mean, you can use this is the day, but my suggestion is you look at this is the day and you look at the citation, it says, Matthew 22. Uh, my preference is that you go to the Bible and look at it and say, what happened before that? Yeah, yeah. What, but, what but, will happen? After, because like 
the readings for, geez, I'm giving out my homily now. <laughs> the readings for the next few weeks is actually um, preparing us to end the liturgical cycle. Right. And we say, why is it that the church is preparing us for the, the end of the liturgical cycle? Because it's already Matthew 22. Jesus is already preparing himself to go to Calvary. So it coincides. Okay. I so just, you should be mindful of that. Yes, I was just wondering, would it be start with the gospel? I mean, read the whole thing, but look up the gospel so we can see it. I, I always do look at the gospel first and then go backwards. Okay. But you can do the other way. You can do the first <laughs> reading, the second reading, and the gospel. It's really up to you, however you're inspired by the Spirit. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Father Richie, you mentioned your homily, and I think you're an amazing homilist. Could you share your process as to how and when you go about writing and preparing your homilies? As I mentioned earlier, before I go to bed on Sunday night, I make sure that I have already looked at the gospel or the, the scripture readings for the coming Sunday. And then uh, instead, of, instead of reading the newspaper, I just ask Alexa what the latest news. <laughs> it's easier. Alexa, what's the latest news? It tells me. Then I go back to the paper if, if, if I have to. But I always use the sacred scripture for the Sunday in addition to my daily prayers. And then by Wednesday, I begin to formulate uh, what I want to say. Thursday, there is a friend of mine from New York that I share my homily with. He shares his homily with me. So he and I, or if we get stuck, we call our lifeline. We go to my friend, um, he's a biblical scholar. Uh, he teaches at, uh, in San Antonio. Um, so we ask if we have questions. Uh, we ask some of the priests, what, what does it mean? What did Jesus mean by this? But blah, blah, blah. By Friday, I should at least have a draft of what I want to say. And then Saturday, I finish the whole thing, be ready for the five o'clock mass. Okay, so there's not a homily.com that you don't cut and paste and just go with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look at some of the commentaries. I do, I have to be honest. I look at some of the commentaries. I, I look at um, homilies.net. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I do. I, I do look at uh, other commentaries as well. Well, I hope you can view the recording of this because if you could see all the smiling faces as you're sharing your thoughts and your ideas and everything. Um, you know, I just think you're such a gift to our community and we're really glad to have you here. Oh, thank, thank you, you Ron. Thank you. What I find amazing is that, you know, there are two priests in the parish I go to. So they're saying masses all week plus Sunday and they have a homily for those weekday masses, you know, and they're very good. I, I just can't imagine the, the preparation and how much time it takes, um, you know, and they're not old people so that they've had a lot of experience. They're fairly young. And so, you know, I just don't know how to do it. <laughs> I would say that the, the weekdays are called homilettes, the smaller okay. versions. And then, of course, the Sunday is the bigger one. For me, whenever the word of God is proclaimed, then... Uh, I, I think uh, Linda would agree with me that it, we have to break open the word every single time we proclaim the word of God. Because mm -hmm. I think we're doing disservice to the word of God if we don't break open the word. Mm -hmm. And they do. And, you know, that's why I, I really admire them. Hey, Father, I don't mean to be this person, but I will be that person if you will give us our <laughs> blessing and do prayer, and we will see everybody next week. Sure. Thank you. Uh, before the final blessing, thank you again for um, taking time to uh, being with us this evening. So let us pray. Thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Loving God, we thank you for sending us Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. 
we thank you for sending us the Spirit, for empowering all of us, for encouraging us, for giving us the wisdom to understand your love, to understand your word. We ask you not to guide all of us, especially during this very, very difficult time. Our hearts are restless, but we rest in thee, our loving God. We thank you for the gift of this evening. We ask you to continue to protect and guide us. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. With your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Father. Salamat. Thank you.